Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, go ahead and uh, we'll, uh, I'll start at least getting my, my computer popped up here to get some text in front of us. Um, we have a couple of firsts uh, today. Um, we have, of course, the confirmation of Jane and Cora, so we give thanks to God for that. Uh, we also have uh, some folks that you may not recognize, uh, and you may, um, may be avoiding them. They are kind of a scary bunch. Uh, they're, they're from Lord of Life in Plano. We're doing our youth, um, well, how would you describe it, Scott? A youth swap, church swap? Sunday morning, where uh, our two youth groups that go to hire things together and do various things throughout the, throughout the year, we thought it would be fun and a great idea to, um, to go to each other's church one Sunday. And so the Lord of Life crew gets to actually hear uh, at least one good sermon this, this year um, and, uh, and Sunday school lessons, so we give thanks to God for that. Uh, Lord of Life's pastor and I are good friends, so uh, I got to get my shots in where I can. Um, yeah, not anymore. <laughs> yeah, right? Not friends anymore. Uh, he, if I didn't say anything, he'd, he'd wonder, right? He'd wonder if we were friends. So uh, welcome to the Lord of Life crew and uh, the, the kids and uh, chaperones. So thank you very much. Uh, we welcome you all. Uh, also, the other first, uh, so I guess this makes three, uh, during early church, it was really, really funny. I'm up there <laughs> preaching. I'm in the sermon and it's at you know, one of these deep, profound points that's just really good. And I start hearing this like tapping. And, you know, kind of during the summer when the sun comes up and things start heating up, so houses settle or windows settle, but it kept going. And I was like, what is this? What's going on? Is it the air conditioner clicking or whatever? And then I start seeing people going like this and like looking over and, and like looking and kind of chuckling. And uh, so I finally, I'm like, what is this? <laughs> Am I hearing things? A bird kept flying into all the windows on the side of the church over there. And so it was quite funny. Somebody said, well, it's, it's the Holy Spirit, the dove trying to get in the <laughs> on Pentecost Sunday. But uh, it, was, it was pretty funny. I have to say, it was, it was quite a chuckle. Um, Can you repeat the most important? Uh, oh, yeah. Well, we yes. Well, I'll, I'll, you'll hear it in second service. You can stay for second church. <laughs> Hey, you can also receive the sacrament twice, too. All right, well, I just, this is just a little, uh, a little interesting saying I, I ran across this week and thought was pretty good, a little meme, uh, Mr. Thomas Sowell. Sowell, Sowell. Um, I, I, I have not read any of his books, but do know and have listened to some of his, his lectures and discussions and whatnot, so I know him to be an honorable man and uh, very very good at articulating some realities of society uh, and politics and economics and whatnot. And I thought this one was pretty good uh, to put up this morning. Some of the biggest cases of mistaken identity are among intellectuals who have trouble remembering that they are not God. Um, and this is, of, this is going to segue us a little bit into, into our discussion today in the book of Proverbs. We are in Proverbs 30. Uh, Proverbs 30 is going to speak uh, kind of to um, the, uh, the one who becomes proud, the intellectual who thinks he's, he's smarter than everybody else in the room. Uh, Proverbs 30 is where we're going to be. Yes, ma'am. Can you understand your... Oh, sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's funny. Good. No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's those new glasses. All right, so remember uh, Proverbs 29 was uh, instruction and guidance for a king or a person in authority. Um, you know, let's just see where we ended with that to take, us, to take us back there. At the end of Proverbs 29, right, it, it sort of closes there in verse uh, 26. Many seek the face of a ruler, but it is from the Lord that a man gets justice. Uh, St. Paul echoes this in Romans 13 saying that, you know, the authorities that we have over us are, are put there by, by God, right? So you kind of see this, you are seeking the face of a ruler, um, but remember, anytime you engage an authority or someone over you, you need to first approach them as a minister of God, St. Paul says in Romans 13. 
And, and uh, to keep that in mind, that uh, as seeking the face of the ruler, um, you, shouldn't be, you shouldn't be seeking, right, to, to get your way by um, baseless uh, celebration or, or by, um, what did we say, um, the fear of a man lays a snare. But there was another saying in Proverbs 29 that said, if you do this, you lay a snare before your, labors, your neighbor's feet. Does anybody remember that? It was kind of profound in, in this discussion with authorities and, and others. If, if you do what? Do you remember what that was? Flatters. Yeah. If uh, you flatter somebody, you are, you are laying a snare before their feet, meaning the, the flattery could be taken uh, in the wrong way or it could be taken in the right way and then you get special special treatment. So uh, this verse 27 and, and pro- is going to sum up Proverbs 29, uh, intended there for uh, those of authority and how we are to interact with them. Now Proverbs 30 is going to change gears again a little bit. Uh, Proverbs 30 um, is going to, and I have a couple of notes here that I'm going to pull up. Um, Proverbs 30 is going to speak about God's kingdom. Uh, It's going to talk about God's kingdom of grace, specifically through the word of God in the church. So verses 1 through 10 is going to talk about uh, the grace of God coming through the word and and that God still teaches and speaks speaks to us. Uh, God's kingdom of good order in verses 11.33. And verses 11.33 is going to be broken up even further between how we live in the family, the order of the family, and the order of the government. And as we get into these texts, this is going to be our our dividing line of how we're going to look at Proverbs 30. Verses 1 through 10, and then verses 11 through 33. And uh, this is is a really kind of a fun chapter. It's a lot of fun because it's going to say some some pretty funny things. But then as you you think about it and contemplate it, um, they're really kind of fun. These are fun Proverbs. Um, and, and very good. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's, let's read verses 1 through 10. All right, verse 1. The words of Agur, son of Jacheh, the oracle. The man declares, I am weary, O God. I am weary, O God, and worn out. Um, can someone read verse 2 for me? I don't want to read that one. Okay, thank you. All right, now I'll continue reading. I have not the understanding of a man. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who's gathered the wind in his fists? Who's wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who's established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? Surely you know. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Two things I ask of you, deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Do not slander a servant to his master, lest he curse you and you be held guilty. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, that verse 10 is kind of the dividing line that we're kind of going through. Um, Here in verses 1 through 10, I make the statement or the claim that this is about God's kingdom of grace through the church. What do you see in there that might, might make me say that about living in God's kingdom and in, in the church and God's kingdom of grace? Are there any key words in there that cause you to think of, oh, the church or me, <laughs> since you know my mind? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, you think of the pastor with the, the stupid statement, I'm too stupid to be a man. Okay. If you have the, the text before you and you can see it, what sort of things would make you think about the church or the spiritual kingdom of God? What? 
Yes, uh, precisely, indeed. Uh, it's, it's talking about, you know, first we see it opening up with declaring the glory of God, right? And, and that he's the one through which all knowledge comes and he has these things. But then, you know, we see it in nature. But then in verse 5, it, it sort, of, sort of changes a little bit of gears and starts talking about the word of God and how there, is, there should be a desire to hear the word of God. And what is the word of God for us? A shield, right? So we, we, we want to be able to, to use this shield, be familiar with it, and know of it. And you can see then also in verses 7 and following, um, right? Remove far from me falsehood and lying, that we want, we want to be taught the truth. We want the, the word of God to be taught in its truth and purity and the sacrament given out according to Christ's institution. These are the two pillars of the church. And so here, um, the author is sort of laying it down first, saying, you see God in nature. You know, God has wisdom above all. But now I want this word to come to me. I don't want to be surrounded by lies. I want to be taught who is the Lord. And then also we kind of see it, he says, as he, as he leads his life, right? He says, you know, I don't want to profane the name of my God, right? We don't want to live our lives in such a way that if everybody knows you go to that Lutheran church, right? We want to live our life in a, in a way that, that, that brings glory to God's house, God's name, which is proclaimed there. So here is, is, is God working through his word, okay, to remove from me falsehood and lying. Now, as we go back up to the beginning, you heard me say the author. We don't know who Agur is. We don't know who Jake or Yache, Yake, Jake. We don't know who either of these guys are, not mentioned anywhere else in scripture. We don't have any idea who they are. There are some guesses that this even Agur could be uh, just like a, a righteous man. The words of a righteous man, son of uh, a, another righteous man. But the clue that we do have that this is um, the word of God or considered the word of God is because he is a man who has righteousness, he has faith, and so he can speak he can speak the word of God. It's kind of like a prophet, that what he says is the word of God. It is worthy of us to contemplate. And this confession, which is interesting because what is one of the things he says, right? He says, I'm a prophet, you should listen to me, but I'm what? I'm too stupid. I don't know, I, I have no understanding, right? But that also means that he's getting his understanding and this proclamation, right, of, from God, right? I have not learned wisdom, right? And wisdom throughout the Proverbs, wisdom is the what? Don't remember one of the repeated phrases. Uh, what, is, what is wisdom according to Proverbs? The fear of God, right? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And we know that also to seeing this, that wisdom is, right? Wisdom is Jesus. And this is speaking of Jesus in the Old Testament. That wisdom, right? It's not just smarts, but look what he jumps to right after that. Nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. So in a sense here, he's saying, look, I'm, I don't know who the promised one is, the promised Messiah. I know God is going to send one. I know the Son of God. I know that God is going to interact in our, in our society and nature in a way. But I don't, I don't know who he is because it hasn't happened yet. Christmas hasn't happened. Doesn't know. So here he's, he's confessing and saying, look, I, I don't know who this embodiment of wisdom is going to be, but I do, I can proclaim the identity of God as we know him now. And look at that verse 4. Does that look familiar? Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Y'all remember Jesus saying that? Right? 
when, when they're questioning Jesus' identity in the gospel, and, and he says, but who is, who is the one who's ascended from heaven except the one who's come down from heaven? So a, a lot of these verses in, in, this, in, in this proverb in particular are, are going to have some clues in the gospel and how Jesus speaks, but also in other parts of the Old Testament. Here in verse 4 and 5, Oh, in particular, verse 4. Now we're going to see, um, see kind of some of your, if any of verse 4 rings a bell to anybody. Here's your chance to show off. Sounds like the book of Job. Hey, there we go. That's right. In fact, it is so very close to Job um, that, one of, that it is one of the cross-references in, in our Lutheran study Bible, if you're there, on, uh, you see in Proverbs 30 uh, and verse 4, the, the footnote down uh, under chapter 30 right there says, see Job 38, 4 to 11. So Job, which comes before Job, which comes before Psalms and Proverbs, Job 38, Job 38, verses 4 through 11. Listen to this. And this is God speaking to Job. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know me. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. And prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no farther. And here shall your proud waves be stayed. Here it, it teaches us to, uh, in, in this Proverbs passage to go through, uh, what, verse 11. Uh, this... This, uh, this speaking of, of Agur, uh, it's like he's repeating what Job has said. So he has this, this knowledge of God. God has revealed to him even as he, as he spoke to Job. So another connection to another Old Testament book or proclamation of who, of who God is. He claims, I have no knowledge of the Holy One, but then uh, right away he he acts like he does. And that's why I kind of explained it or said it the way I did, that he can say, I know who God is. He has revealed to me these things about him, but I don't yet know the Messiah. I don't know yet God become flesh, the Messiah who's promised to come. So Agur, a righteous man, he has faith in knowing that God will send someone. And look at how confident he is. Look at this statement right here. What is, his, what is his name? He's going to say God is, is, is going to have a name. This, this God, the Holy One, he says, what is his name? Remember, and that's a big deal about, about Jesus, isn't it? When he's born, right, what does his name mean, Jesus? He will save his people from their sins. It's all this big deal about his name, uh, and also, too, what is this, this name? What is his son's name going to be? Surely you know. So even as God sort of backhands Job, if you will, when Job thinks he can accuse God of wrongdoing, that Job knows the, the way of things, so here, too, in this proverb, it's, it's kind of like Agur, the author, kind of saying, hey, who are you? Surely you know. Who are you to to accuse God, right, of being wrong. Who are you? Every word of God proves true, a shield. Do not add, lest he rebuke you and be found a liar. Now, uh, any, any questions or, or thoughts with this so far up through verse 7? Well, then speak up. Speak up, Ellie Mae. Um, 
here, then, he recognizes the danger of lying and falsehood. That this is, uh, this is a danger that he's asking God to, to preserve him from. Two things I ask of you. He's here petitioning, praying to God. Do not deny them before me, before I die. Remove all falsehood and lying. This means that we should not tolerate lies. We should not tolerate a false gospel. We should not tolerate these things. We should understand that when we hear falsehood, when we hear lies, it is dangerous. It has an effect on us. It is not, it is not good. And then he compares it and says, right, you should look at lying and falsehood, right, <laughs> and say, say also to God, give me not poverty nor riches. I think the first part of it we can kind of agree with. <laughs> the second part's where we're kind of like, ah, goor, I don't know. Feed me with food that is needful for me. This is a profound part of this too, I think. It's, it's pretty great where he sort of expands on this idea. Uh, Give me neither poverty nor riches, lest I be full and deny you, and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. So here he, he sort of points out this, this danger that the answer is, when I was in college, I was, uh, was an electrical engineering major, and... Um, I was a little conflicted on what I was going to do with my life. And part of the reason was because I, I said, well, you know, I, I know, and part of it is because I was lazy too, but I said, you know, I struggled with myself. I said, I, I know I don't want to be poor. <laughs> and, and I kind of see that happening as I'm paying for college. I'm getting poorer every day. Um, but then I also had this rub that I knew that I didn't, I, I saw all around me, especially here in DFW, all the money and all the people who were not satisfied with all the riches. And I said, I, I went and talked to this professor, my counselor, I guess, and I said, you know, what do I do? Because right? I'm, I'm conflicted with studying to become an engineer. I want to make money, but I don't want to be rich. And, and he said, he had great advice. He said, well, nobody can tell you what to do. You have to make the decision yourself. You have to be settled in this. And he said, well, you know, you're afraid that you're going to fall for the love of money. And he said, being poor doesn't fix that. <laughs> so here I, here I was trying for an excuse to, you know, for, trying for an excuse to, to turn away from, from this, this promise that the, the sciences give, you know, engineering of, of wealth and prosperity, but... Um, but also didn't, you know, it was this inner turmoil within me. And, and he said that, and that really helped me as, as a young college student. It was like, look, you know, you're going you're gonna to have that temptation whether you're rich or poor. Having money doesn't solve it, and being poor isn't going to solve it. And it's a spiritual condition. And this is what Agur is pointing out. And he, he does it in a really, a really faithful and, and good way, admirable way. We have all the money in the world, and we're full, and we end up saying, who is the Lord? Yeah, who needs him? What do I, what do I need this for? Right? I've got just about everything I need. I'd be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? And, and so look, that is, he is saying the temptation is to make him go backwards, right? That he says uh, this idea of once you have the faith, you can become so full what do we fill ourselves on that causes us to question who is, who is, what is the, who is God? What can we fill ourselves on? Junk. Yeah, John. Earthly possessions. Earthly possessions. Any, anything else? Pride. 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 Yeah, kind of, kind of leading from the other things he said in the previous proverb about laying a snare as we started off with that um, we get full of what, how does the saying go? We get full of what? With Pride. We get full of ourselves, right? I, I like that one. We get full of ourselves. Any, what else, anything else that you can think of that, that we need to be on the lookout for as Christians that we, we become full of? 
greed, lust, our what? What was the other one? Our works. Our works. Yeah, we can become, we can become full of ourselves on our works. And uh, flesh that out a little bit more. How is that a, that a danger? Yeah, we, we rely on them for what? For assurance in our salvation. Yeah, standing before God. Assurance of our salvation. That's right. Good. Any, any other dangers for us? Right? No, nothing in particular, but what can we fill ourselves on? Okay, now the other side of that. Lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. How do we? Fa- how can we? How can we starve ourselves? What's the other side of this equation? Starve yourself by not hearing the word. We can spiritually starve ourselves by not hearing the word, which he just spent time saying how important it is, and it does not lie. So we can starve ourselves spiritually of not hearing the word. Also, too, receiving the sacrament. Right? That is a a spiritual starvation, uh, a gift of God that we can we can misuse. Okay, the company maybe we're in, um, current, current company notwithstanding. Um, uh, yeah, I can see that, right? That, um, how so? How do you, because I, you know, we're called to be in the world. So what, how, what would you answer to that? Obviously, it, you want to help and, you know, people turn to the word of God. So I'm not saying don't surround yourself, but if you are not surrounded by people that have similar beliefs that you mm-hmm. on a on a pretty good standard basis, um, let's say you surround yourself by people all the time that are doing drugs and alcohol or whatever the vice might be and not trying to turn that, eventually that will become mm-hmm. okay for you. Yeah. If you yeah. have lack of faith. And, uh, so um, be, you're part of the world. You're, you're in the world. Don't, don't be part of the world. Don't be of the, not of the world. Yeah. So wholesome, maybe faithful community is important. Right? We're told in the scriptures to encourage one another. So you can starve yourself if you aren't, if you aren't, um, you know, there's all sorts of voices and things in the world, our radios, our television, our phones. If you aren't getting the good in, then all the other noise will, it will overtake you. Well, in your sermon this morning, you said... Oh, thank you. Can you say that again, please? <laughs> You said, tell yourself, I'm not going to sin today and see how well you do. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, yeah. that if you don't, if you're not in the Word, if you're not surrounding yourself in the community, Satan, the liar, will get you to succumb to year enough. Yeah, yeah. And, and, um, and also, you know, this, this idea of measuring... <laughs> You know, measure how much you take in, right? How much, how much information from secular sources are you pulling in, right? What are you filling your ears with? You need to be filling your ears. You, you know, just, just think, our ancestors, how much, how much information, I mean, literal sound, did they take in compared to us? Uh, almost, I mean, man, the... the, the the difference in that, I, you, you know, my mom was, was, was um, you know, she, she had this saying and she was kind of talking about air quality and she, and it's kind of, I just laugh, but anyway, because I'm, my, I, I like big, tr- uh, big trucks, right, loud trucks, right, you know, diesels and whatnot. And um, my mom was talking about air quality and she, she said, you know, when a bus passes by us, you know, we are, we, we breathe in as much fumes and exhaust that our ancestors you know, 100 years ago, never were exposed to. That you, you're, that, and I see that kind of on a larger level here, the noise, the, the babble, the podcast, the news, everything will have an effect on you. And you bring it in, so you, you need to balance that, that effect. You need to be hearing good, faithful teaching. Don't starve yourself or fill yourself just on secular things. Um, consider the, the things of God. Be, you know, set your mind on things above, the scriptures tell us. And, and to, to keep that in mind, that you don't starve yourself uh, in that, that manner, in that way. Any other thoughts on that? 
and oh, and, and Lutherans have been at the forefront of social media, right? Do y'all know that? Y'all, y'all heard of the Lutheran Hour, right? This, do, what are some of the stats from the Lutheran Hour? Do you know? Like, when did it begin? I don't, I don't know. It was way before my time. 1950s with Waldemar. Yes, some of the 50s. The, the Lutheran Hour was, was known worldwide and, and proclaimed, and the gospel was heard over the airwaves. Even Billy Graham said, man, those Lutherans in the Lutheran Hour, they are way ahead in regard to social media. In addition, do you all know what the top religious, the top downloaded religious podcast on iTunes is? Do you know this, or are you raising your hand for something else? Oh, I was going to say, it was like even before the 60s, like the first social media, the printing press. The printing press happened when? At the time of the Reformation. Yeah. God wants us to get the message out. He's trying to tell us. Lutheran Hour, the top downloaded religious podcast on iTunes, Issues, Etc. It's, it's downloaded more than good old shiny teeth Olstein. Although, he's, he's not, I thought that's what everybody knew him as. Bling teeth? <laughs> oh, blinky, blinky, yeah, blinky, yeah. Um, that uh, it's, it's amazing that we Lutherans, you know, we, and, and you know, this too, uh, I don't know if Christopher can, can correct me on this, our social media guru, um, which you got to work on my appearance on these videos, okay? That's... Let's, 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 fair enough, fair enough. If you give it, you got to take it. Let's just, yeah, right, just, yeah. Um, very good. Um, that, uh, now I have no idea. Oh, yeah. Um, when I, yeah, where am I going with this? When I check it, I can see, right, in the parts of the world. We can trace the parts of the world where our, our services and, and the Bible studies are being played. And it's all over the world. I mean, we're, and especially with our connection to the, the, you know, the schools in Africa and down in Guatemala. You know, we were in Guatemala and people are living at dirt floors and saran wrap roofs, but they all have cell phones. And they're all like, Pastor, what, churches, what church do you preach at? I was like, oh, Emmanuel? They're like, I want to follow, you know. So our, our reach, even our, our congregation here, our reach is far beyond anything we are, you know, and we need to take advantage of this ourselves as Christians and be filling our ears. Uh, this is a Lutheran uh, tradition. This is a Lutheran stronghold, and, and we can't concede that to the world. And we as listeners need to support the gospel in all its ways, uh, at your church, but also some of these uh, other outreach outreach things. So, uh, were you going to say something, Mr. Scarf? Well, yeah, I was. Um, I, you know, I, lo- I enjoy Proverbs. I like Proverbs. Uh, there's a, so much in here, so much instruction that is completely timeless. You can't nail this down and say, oh, well, that was then. Yeah. I read there in account today, but I mean, this section... I mean, setting the metaphorical aside, this is very much literal. Mm -hmm. Lord, don't let me go too far. Don't bless me too far one way. Don't starve me too far the other way. Because this speaks to human nature. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is look around at our modern, progressive society in this country and around the world to see examples yeah. Of the dangers of don't give me too much, yeah, and see how far our country has slid, yeah, off the rails. Well, and 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 that's what we tell our young people growing up too, right? Oh, you need to, you need, you want to, you want to be, you want to be, you know, rich. You want to be wealthy. You want all these things. Uh, you want to get a good job, right? You want to be successful in all the ways that the world tells you to. Um, we need to remember to tell them. Well, what should we tell them? Do we tell them that you want to be faithful? That it's all vanity. <laughs> yeah, it's all vanity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Then <laughs> jump jump into the other. Yes, absolutely. So how does how does Jesus teach us to pray that verse eight? Give us this day our daily bread. Yeah. 
even see that. It's almost, it's almost like it's the same author. <laughs> Mind blown. What's interesting too when you're talking about everything that was just stated, like um, there was something I had to answer recently. It was like, what are the best, or what are the most important assets that you provide for your child? Mm -hmm. And I was like, the word of God. Yeah. The foundation of God. And this person's like, well, well that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, but I don't, you know, the educational this, that, she wanted all these other things listed. And I was like, but honestly, it's the word of God. That's, yeah. that's the best thing I can provide for my child. <laughs> and did, did you <laughs> say... Like, good enough. I was like, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah, did you say, well, oh, bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> I should have. I was like... <laughs> yeah. uh, I was like okay. um, verse 10 there, too. You know, you can see that, that and this also is part of the reason why um, this is considered the kingdom of God through the church, through the setting, right, too, because, you know, we have it with Moses, right, that, that when the pe God said to the people, he said, when you grumble against Moses, you're grumbling against me, right? So long as Moses is there, and, and Moses wasn't really even that great. I mean, he didn't, he kind of, you know, to get people's ad admiration and to follow him, Right, but also too, you know, then Jesus sending his disciples, and now as we uh, in the New Testament, we are reminded says, don't, you know, don't don't go after the, I mean, specifically the the pastors, right, and the pastoral office. They are to give an account for you. They are to give a spiritual account for you. So don't make their lives difficult because that's of no reward to you. So from now on, if you want to talk to me, you got to, you got to first go through the secretary. Tell her all the problems. She's not here. She's not here. I thought she was going to be here, but she said she'll be here for church. But, but uh, yeah, yeah. No, no. But in all seriousness, right? And this is part of our 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 job, right? As pastors, and not trying to deflect anything, right? However. Um, this, this is another, this verse here is another reason why St. Paul admonishes us to, to pray for our pastors and, and to encourage them, to lift them up, because they are to give an account for you before God. That's a, that's a real thing, and that's a good thing too, because think about this related to what we've been saying. All the noise that you hear in the world on TV and on the internet, and all these people giving you advice... Is God going to hold them accountable for what they're saying to you? Are they accountable for what, ha what you do with what they say? The book of James says teachers will be judged more harshly. But they're spouting out all this stuff, putting it out on the airwaves, and we, and the news and all these things. Do these people, are, are they saying this because they know that they're going to have to give an account for what they, how they teach you and guide you? And our understanding in the Missouri Synod, too, is as pastors are trained, we have this verse out before us as, as pastors, and it's, it's ingrained in us, not that, not that we're perfect, that, that's not what the Scripture says. But we have this understanding that we take very seriously what we say and what we teach with this full recognition that we're going to have to give an answer, we're going to have to give an account to God, not only for what we've said and taught, but also those who've been under us. And... and that, that's something to think of when you're listening to teachers or advice is secular advice and teaching is good. We need to have good professors. We need to learn things, but also know where to walk, how to balance that of saying, okay, this, this person is, all, you know, they can teach me how to change a tire, but they're, they're, not, they're not accountable for my soul. They're not, they're not going to give an account to God before me, for me, before him. Dave. Didn't he say those who are in authority to be, they're going to be judged at a different level because they're put in authority by God? Yeah, so. absolutely. Yep. Yep. And with authority to whom, to whom much has been given, much is expected. You know, authority always has a, a, an, an amount of accountability, right? Who has the authority to create life? Husband and wife. You know, if you follow the Ten Commandments, it's kind, of an, it's kind of a guide on who has authority in various, various places, right, in the course of our, our human life. He taught the Israelites when they said, we want a king. You want a king? I'll give you kings, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, uh, yes, yeah, Jessica. 
question. How do you kind of marry that concept with the New Testament where it talks about, um, you know, leading children or little ones astray and mm. leading them away from the truth where, you know, it's better to have a millstone tied to your neck? So is that just authority figures or people who influence children or the idea that robbing somebody of the Word of God and that knowledge of salvation is damning? Yeah, I, I think it's, it, it's all of that. Yeah. I think especially in, in context, you know, Jesus says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. Yeah. So anybody, you know, and, and it can get taken pretty far. And as parents, we have to be, you know, very careful of who we put our children under. You know, who, who, are we, who is teaching them? And then making sure that we do a good job of talking with them and, and hearing and letting them tell us what they're learning and picking up. Because even as a teacher, you know, I'll, I'll ask my students, say, what did I just say? And, and I'll be like, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> you know, I didn't teach that. You know, and a lot of times the fault is with the teacher. Um, but I think it's all of those. Anybody who would cause a child to sin, and especially, look at this. Look at what he does in verse 10 then. Especially those who would teach their children to rebel against their parents. This is something that is... The Bible does not mince words with this. You rebel against your parents. Um, that, that's, that is wicked. That is, a, that is something that God does not play around with. Now, with children, right, and where we're parent, their parents, we come at it from a place of love. But if children continue to rebel against their parents, then they're going to incur the wrath of the authorities who don't come at them from a place of love. Does that answer your question? It's kind of long-winded. Sorry. That's a good answer, and you can even stretch that to technology and places where their minds could be polluted by those who do not have their best interests. Yeah, and they, yeah, they have no responsibility. They have no accountability for what they're saying and teaching and giving. Well, there is some of that. I mean, if you look at Matthew 12, it says, whether they're teachers or not, it says on the judgment day, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, whatever is coming out of that, that will be judged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. Whether we're in the church or not, right? Okay, um, well, I, I think that's good enough uh, for today. We'll, we can get into the second half of this in two weeks. Um, I like it because it talks about, uh, talks about leeches and uh, three things that are never satisfied. Uh, this is the, we didn't quite get to the second half of this in 11 and following, uh, but it gets juicy uh, and, and fun. These are some of the most memorable po proverbs. Uh, as I was looking at them and studying them, I just thought, man, this is, this is just... This is just great. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll be back at that uh, in two weeks. Any closing questions or remarks? Okay, let's close with a prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the opportunity to gather together with your faithful, to come to your house of prayer, that not only do we pray, but you also teach and speak us. You send your Holy Spirit today, especially on Pentecost. We remember that the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of judgment, to convict the world of sin, to convict us of righteousness, and to convict the world of judgment. Be with us. Help us to remember this joy of being your people. Uh, may we guard not only our mouth, but also our ears and what we receive, that we may bless your name in all things. Be with our church and all your faithful, dear Heavenly Father. We pray for our brothers and sisters uh, who gather at Lord of Life this morning and uh, for their presence with us today. We give you thanks for the fellowship we have and ask you to continue to bless all churches with uh, good fellowship and the joy that it is to be your people. We ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen.